What is up, everybody? We have 10 minutes to make you hungry. Across from me virtually, we have Mr. Chad Belding from The Foul Life, host of The Foul Life, and a host of other major waterfowl-related content platforms. Some some are less waterfowl-related with some of the podcasts and things that you have going on, but all sorts of good things. And we're going to make you hungry with a uh, with a holiday goose recipe. Uh, Chad, you, you have a lot of stuff going on in the cooking realm as well. And it always seems like you hear like on whatever, you know, holiday-related TV shows, it's like, oh, Christmas goose this, Christmas goose that. Well, what the heck is a good goose recipe that people can, uh, you know, uh, if they have company over or if it's on, you know, the big holiday day? Or what's what's a good thing that people should be thinking about to use that goose and uh, make something for family and friends? Yeah, man, I appreciate you having me on, Mark. And uh, I see behind you, I, I think I see, uh, I think my daughter plays a game called I Spy. I think I see a, uh, a provider cookbook. Yeah, over your left shoulder. Oh, yeah, right I got there. it right here. If, if this cord's yeah, uh, man, we, long uh, enough, I'll bring it over. We're coming up on a year anniversary of the first edition of the Provider Cookbook, 264 pages, Mark, of uh, 80 different recipes. And what we tried to do is we tried to show, you know, that whole mentality of where does our food come from and living off the land. And when you start to mention things like Christmas goose and holiday goose or fall goose recipes, um, I like to mix it up a little bit. And I think that you have to really take into consideration of, well, what kind of goose are we talking about? Do you live in Michigan to where you might not really see a lot of speckle belly geese, but you might have a good shot at a Canada goose. Do you do you live in Arkansas where you can kill a speck or maybe a snow or you're in California where you might have a shot at a cackler or a speckle belly or snow. So I, in that book, you're going to find a recipe that is a, a full body or a breast with skin on style speckle belly goose that is at 100%. Let's get this out of the way, Mark Borman, that we consider speckle bellies at this camp the number one waterfowl. I know that people say the sandhill crane is the ribeye in the sky and they say that you got to have a, a teal, you got to have a wood duck. Well, I've had them all in there and, and trust me, I, I like all of them. I love canvas back. Um, I love mallards, but speckle belly geese in the wet rice or dry rice this time of year, as we're speaking right now, November, December, early January, they're an amazing table fare. So the skin on them, the, the fat, the crispiness that you can get with that. Um, we use a Traeger grill. We smoke them out. We watch our internal temperature. Obviously, the number one mistake people make with waterfowl is what, just like any other wild game or fish, we overcook it, and then we all, all, all automatically give it a bad reputation. It's livery. It's tough. It's gamey. Waterfowl is uh, not, for lack of better terms, when you're cooking a speck, it's spectacular. So when when you get that when you get that meat smoked, I like to bring it in to a temperature internally with the thermometer. We use the meter probe to where it's always in there, you know, during the the entire cook, and you never take it out. And you're watching your app on your phone, and when that internal temp of that breast meat and that speck reaches about a hundred degrees, I remove it from the smoke. And at that time, I have a large cast iron going where I have a little bit of olive oil in there. We've teamed up with Napa Valley Olive Oil, which if anybody's ever not tried it, I highly recommend it. This family is producing the best I've ever tasted in Napa, California. I get that to about 600 degrees, and then I just use my tongs, and I keep turning that goose in that hot oil in that cast iron, and it's on a propane open flame or however you can get it to high heat, and I just keep turning it with that skin, crisping the legs, crisping the back crisping all of the breast all of the fat and skin on top of the breast meat where you have the tenderloin underneath there um, and, and what that's doing is that's going to continue to get that internal meat higher in temperature but it's also giving us that crispiness of that skin so at that time while that skin is getting crispy I'm gonna keep watching my internal temp and when it reaches 125 degrees I take it off and I set it aside and if you can follow along in that cookbook we're gonna go over to a skillet now and we're gonna use blackberries or we're gonna use blueberries we're gonna use some kind of uh, berry that we're gonna be able to reduce and create a reduction sauce that's gonna take a little bit of that fat that we're gonna have from a previous cooked bird, I always render my fat, Mark Boardman, to where I, throughout the entire year I have frozen canisters of speckle belly fat, mallard fat, different forms of wild goose fat to where I can cook broths with, I can cook different meats or vegetables in. So I'm going to take a little bit of my duck or goose fat and I'm going to start this reduction sauce with a little bit of that, 
tiny bit of butter, my berries, and then I'm just going to add to it as I need. It might need a little salt added to it. And I'm going to, at the very end, I'm going to take our foul provider rub and I'm, it's got a little bit of a sweetness to it. And I'm going to sprinkle that into this reduction, berries, berry reduction sauce. And that's going to just simmer on the stove. I'm going to keep stirring it with a spoon, letting that butter and those berries melt down with that duck fat in there. And pretty soon you're going to have a perfect reduction sauce that's going to bring color. And when you slice into that speck, you're going to slice straight down that breastbone, taking the breast meat off. You're going to use some, some really sharp shears to cut the legs off. You're going to then take that breast, slice it against the grain with the skin on the top, and you're going to just spread it out. It's going to look like a, 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 a grade A Wagyu you know, uh, ribeye laying there and it's going to be medium rare by this time after you let it sit for about 10 minutes while you're cooking your sauce, it's going to be at 131 to 133 degrees internal temp, medium rare. And then I'm going to take that reduction sauce and I'm going to dribble it over the top. I'm going to set my legs out to the side of it and then I'm going to plate it and you're going to have a speckle belly goose skin and fat on with a berry reduction sauce with a tiny hint of butter in that provider foul rub. And I'm telling you, it's like you will not one person and I, and I would bet money on this because I live in Nevada where betting is legal. I would bet that not one person at your Thanksgiving or your Christmas table is going to say, that's not beef. That's not, that's not, there's no way that's wild game. There's no way you're going to sell me that that's a goose that you're eating. It will literally taste like filet mignon, I promise you. Chad, I am drooling on my microphone right now. Like I don't, I'd like I, I, I need to figure out what page this is on. But I don't yeah, even look it up in there. It's I don't even there. need to look at it. I could see it. You were painting a picture of this thing. I mean, it sounds, it sounds beautiful to the eye, and it sounds like just amazing with all the flavors and and the different things that you're talking about and cooking it rare and and having that that fruit element. Um, is this something where so this is like this is re- this is a skin on whole bird that you're bringing you're you're bringing it to temp and then you're and then you're kind of crisping it up the skin in that cast iron then am I following that correctly? A hundred percent. I always do a technique called reverse sear. Whether I'm cooking a beef steak or I'm cooking a pork chop or I'm cooking chicken wings, I always use smoke. And I'm not a huge smoke fan. I'm I'm not even a huge traditional barbecue fan. But there is a need for smoke when it comes to flavoring meat or flavoring vegetables. I love a little bit of smoke on my Brussels sprouts, my broccoli, my my asparagus, whatever I'm eating greens-wise. I like to hit it with a tiny hint of smoke. So on my meats, a lot of people, you know, they'll they'll go after that traditional uh, Texas brisket, fat down with a, a ton of smoke on it, and they get that bark. And a lot of people love that. But I'm not a huge, I don't like my mouth to be full of a ton of smoky flavor. So I hit it with that smoke for a little bit. And then when I take it off of there, that olive oil mixed with the rubs that we rub that meat with. And I didn't even go over that part, but you know, when you get your, you, you, a lot of people automatically think water, waterfowl or wild game, we got to marinate it. Well, I, I do believe in brines. I believe in wet brines, dry brines, but I am a huge advocate of just dry rubs. Mm-hmm. If you take care of your goose or your deer, or your antelope or whatever the wild game is, your harvest from the field, to the freezer, to the processing butchering table, that's where it starts, right? So when I get my speck laid out on the table, it's beautiful. It's plucked. All of all of the feathers, all of the pin feathers, they're out of it. And then I like to take dry rub, and I love to use our foul rub. I love to use different types of rubs. There's Whiskey Bent Barbecue. There's so many great rub companies out there that we believe in. I like to even use a tad of Tony Chastry's Cajun seasoning in a lot of these recipes. But I do not skimp on our rubs. At the provider, our rubs are less than 40% salt content. So you can go to town by covering every inch of that bird and not worrying about overdoing it because it's going to be too salty. So with our rubs on there, that bird's going to turn to a reddish color. That's when we put it on the smoke. And then the reverse sear technique is everybody thinks, let's sear at the beginning. Let's get it nice and hot and let's sear. Well, what that does is, in my opinion, is when it gets hot, it crystallizes, right? And it automatically closes up all of the ability for that meat to bring that rub in because you've gotten it so hot on the outside, now you've prevented it for the rest of the cook to get in, to get, reach that internal temp of medium rare. None of your flavor is going to get in there. If you smoke it at the beginning, let that meat get wet. Let that meat get you know moist and let, it starts to bring that rub in. Now by the time you take it off of that smoke, all of the flavor has gone into it. Now what you do with the reverse sear mark is you seal it all in there. By now you scorch it on the outside with the bark, the crust, the crispy skin, and none of that flavor comes out until you cut it with a knife. It sounds absolutely 
Amazing. Um, do we do we have a couple minutes on the recipe? Yeah, sure. Or are we done? I just wanted to talk real quick on somebody that doesn't get to eat speckle belly because a lot of goose hunters or waterfowl hunters would be like, I'm going to try that with a Canada goose. And I'm not saying that it's not going to turn out because I've had some amazing Canada goose. But remember, Canada goose is going to take a little bit extra of brining. It's going to take a little bit extra of the before methods uh, that we talk about. Getting it out of the freezer, making sure that it's not freezer burnt at all, making sure that you don't have a ton of thick skin on those big 12, 14 pound greater Canada's because you're going to have to score that now. You're going to want to take a really sharp knife and score that skin and make sure that you're going to be able to get those rubs or that brine down into the meat because they're a lot tougher birds. Speckle bellies migrate the same time as pintails do. I mean, they are a pansy bird. They come down in late August. A lot of times you'll start to see them showing up. Canada geese, they'll be up in northern Alberta in January if if you're not careful. I mean, it takes a, a, a it takes the duck gods to really get stuff shaken up to get Canada geese and mallard ducks to migrate. So if you're thinking Canada geese, I want you to think of a recipe in that book. Go to the page where it says pulled Canada goose sandwiches. And when you see that method of pulled Canada goose, everybody's going to think again, traditional barbecue, pulled pork. Amazing way to eat Canada geese. We, we go to Canada. You can kill eight birds a day per man. You go to New upstate New York like we did in September. You can kill 15 Canada geese per man per day for the molt migration season. Okay? A lot of states are eight birds a day. Oklahoma, you can shoot eight. Cal Colorado, you can kill six. So you go for a three- or four-day hunt, you got a lot of meat. So what I do is, in, and people say that a pressure cooker or a crock pot can be cheating. In a lot of ways, maybe it can. I like to use the Traeger for my long, slow-cooked smokes like you would on a traditional pork butt, pork shoulder, brisket, stuff like that. Low heat, 210 degrees, 220 degrees, light smoke, foil tin, Canada goose breast with skin off that you've cut out of your meat, put it in there, and all that you have in there is apple juice, something that's got high acidity. So better than apple juice would be apple cider, 100% apple cider, or Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, something that has carbonation or high acidity in it cover that meat with that foil over the top your rubs are in there i put some lemons i put limes you can do onions whatever and that meat slow cooks for seven hours after the seventh hour you go in there and you check it if it still has a little uh, toughness to it you turn it high for one hour by the end of that eighth hour mark you're going to be able to take two forks and pull that meat apart at that time that hot broth is still sitting in there that you cooked it in after you pull it apart, you put it back in there and let it simmer in that broth for a few minutes. <clears throat> it's going to have a little bit of a raspberry pinkish color in that meat. It's going to pull apart just like pork. Now you have this whole slew of Canada goose meat. And what we did in New York this year, Mark, is we made stacked nachos. We took uh, outlaw snacks, so you can use whatever tortilla chip you want. You put them on the bottom of a foil tin, one layer of chips. You come in with your cheeses. We use the three cheese blend, whatever flavors you like. Then we take that 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 uh, pulled Canada goose meat and we put it all over the top of the cheese, put some onions on there, and now we come in with another layer of chips. Same thing, cheese, Canada goose pulled meat, some some onions, olives, whatever, then another layer of chips, and then a bunch of cheese and a bunch of goose on the top of that. Back in the Traeger, and we bake that off on a high heat for about 10 minutes until that upper, top layer of cheese. And remember, a Traeger or any kind of t convection oven, you're cooking from all the way around it. So the bottom and the sides are getting the same treatment. And when we take it out, you can cut it like lasagna or cut it like enchiladas. Mark, I'm telling you, you would never believe you're eating Canada goose meat. So if you're somewhere in the country or the flyaway where you're not privy to speckle belly geese and you get snows or Canada's, slow cook them follow that pulled goose recipe use them for sandwiches use them for enchiladas put them on top of your salad we did a pulled canada goose omelet feed in new york that blew everybody's mind so get creative be unorthodox think outside of the box and don't be afraid to try new things and when you taste that pulled canada goose you're going to be like i'm going to learn how to blow a goose call better i'm going to learn decoy and i'm going to learn flagging i'm going to train my dog we're going goose hunting because a lot of people don't really chase Canada geese when they because they don't like to eat them. Canada goose hunting is exciting. You have to have a great strategy to get them consistently, and then you can turn them into amazing table fare. So the pulled Canada goose, the speckle belly skin fat on with the re berry reduction sauce, those are two recipes that I would that I would look forward to making this holiday season. Man, they sound off the charts, Chad. And I'm glad you you brought up the Canada goose side of things because I feel like that's what 
a lot of folks have access to, you know, in the state that they live in. And you you literally answered my next question. I was going to say, hey, does a Canada goose, if a person wants to try that spec recipe, can you sub Canada goose? And it sounds like you can, but maybe they're better suited for some other recipes. Just, just yeah, I would say get a speckle belly, go book a hunt with an outfitter. You can go to Arkansas right now, Louisiana, East Texas, book with Rocky Merlot and Merlot Waterfowl. You can kill 10 specks per band per day in California. You go out there for a three-day hunt with a cooler or two coolers with a couple of your buddies, and you keep a wing on. There's processing companies out there that will pluck them, put, keep the wing on. Keep your full-body specks. If you do choose to breast them, keep the skin and fat on. I promise you, you'll want to do that. Get them home and go to town on those speckle bellies. If you don't get a lot of speckle bellies and you have Canada geese, just picture that pulled Canada goose meat right now and all of the things that you can do with it. I promise that you can freeze it and take it out and make breakfast burritos with, wrap it in a tortilla with some cheese the next morning for a, for your next hunt. You'll think that you're eating pulled pork or pulled beef. You know, you put a, a beef roast in a steam cooker, a pressure cooker or a crock pot, Mark. You can put potatoes in it. You know, our moms did it all the time. Let's have some beef. That's all they were doing was slow cooking it and pressure mm-hmm. cooking it, right? And it's kind of like the sous vide method, the French bath water, right, of, of putting it in a vacuum seal bag and cooking it in hot water and then taking it out and, and scorching it or reverse searing it and putting a crust on it. You know, there's all these different ways. Sous vide goose is an amazing way to cook waterfowl. We haven't even got into sous vide method, but that, that, that pulled goose method, that full body spec with the berry reduction sauce, you'll think that you're eating a five-star meal at the Nuzeret guy, the, uh, the Salt Bay guy. That, you know, just, just imitate him or whatever you need to do to make yourself feel like a professional chef because when people taste it, they're going to think that you went to culinary school, I promise you. Man, I believe it. I believe it, man. Those are some great suggestions. And, and you have one that I feel like is on, like, you know, the main course, fancier side of things. And then you have one that's just like, like you said, I mean, you got some liberal limits out there with those Canada's, you know, some great ways to not only make a great meal, but a meal that's easily shareable and a meal that's going to use that that great meat that you worked so hard to get. So, Chad, thank you so much. Uh, I think everybody's holidays are going to be a little bit happier with this newfound knowledge. And uh, you can listen to this recipe here and get all hyped up about it. And if you want some step-by-step instructions, just get yourself this provider cookbook. And I appreciate it. ProviderLife.com, TheProviderLife.com. And we truly appreciate all the support. And thank you to Vortex for having us on. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Chad. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Try one of these recipes. I don't think you'll be disappointed. I know I'm going to give one of these things a shot here pretty soon. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. 